Well, hello! <laughs> Hi, this is Maya, and uh, this is the new episode of By All Means Necessary. Welcome to April. Yes, uh, this time I know which month we are in. And I am the actual epitome of laziness. Like, I don't even know if, if you can hear me, because this mic has been extended to its fullest potential, like, over the desk. And yeah, I just have my legs up, I'm trying to make myself comfortable. Because we have a long, long episode in front of us. <laughs> So my body is super lazy, but my mind is super hyped, because the whole of March I was denying myself caffeine, right? And can you, can you hear it in my voice that I'm not doing that anymore? So uh, yeah, I'm back with no sugar month, because that was awesome. Like, I didn't crave anything after that month, which is the best thing. You know, fully recommend. I want to say holy recommend, like holy milk. No, what? <laughs> Holy meal. Oh god, I'm losing my shit. Okay, another thing is my best advice to podcasters if you are not taking this seriously and you know, but you at the same time are like if you listen to my podcast and you, you know, you want uh, that kind of approach towards podcasting is to record an episode a week in advance but to edit it just like a day before the release date is just so much fun. Like you are just gonna laugh because like you forget about the case you researched and <laughs> you completely forgot what you're on about and then you just laugh at your own jokes. Yep, that's the, the approach I'm having towards this life. Also today I reached another level of quarantine. Like husband brought home printer, okay? I have lost my mind. I have... <laughs> <laughs> this sounds a printer. Like when this thing was printing, I was in some sort of epiphany. Like I have never heard a printer print paper. I was like, this is so beautiful. <laughs> Literally, I just held his hand. I was like, just uh, can you can you be here with me? And he's like, it's a printer. Now uh, we have another motorbike situation. That's great. That's off to a great start. So uh, yeah, pay attention to stuff that prints. Guys, <laughs> appreciate everything, every single sound, however annoying you manage to find it. This part was just supposed to explain the title of this episode. Episode because you know not all of you are multilingual <laughs> the shade the says the levels of this life so I appropriated the expression obviously to the episode that we have ahead because it's about Colombian drug dealers right so the expression is to be in Spanish and guess what I know some of it so <laughs> okay cut to the core cut to the chase mucho ruido y pocas nueces is the actual expression it literally means a lot of noise and a few nuts what it actually means is like when somebody's old talk. Even when you google it you get the Shakespearean drama but I think it was done as a movie. Like all of these actors look super young, like Keanu Reeves, young Emma Thompson. <laughs> I don't know why it comes immediately with the Spanish translation though, like there's probably other shit out there <laughs> that uses this expression. But no, this is what comes up so we should all go watch it, right? No, of course not. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna cut this out, but go on Patreon if you wanna hear a story about how much I love or don't love Shakespeare and how much I give a fuck. So now that we learned uh, the expression, the twisted version of it is mucho ruido y muchas nueces, which is what happens in this story, because it's not all talk, it's all talk and then all work, and there's a lot of nuts, and by nuts I mean bullets in people's bodies, flying from a motorcycle hitman. That's how you don't spoil a fucking story, right? Imagine how funny it would be if I just continued speaking broken Spanish. The, all the audience I have would be like, uh, the fuck? <laughs> like, and then uh, I would gain other audience that also would understand, so that would be pointless. <laughs> I'd just be there like, aguantad, okay? Aguantad! Put up with me, for fuck's sake. I do this for free. You don't pay me, you don't rule my world. <laughs> That was intense as fuck, god, okay, let's, let's move on. <laughs> it's kind of, it's one case, but I'm covered, it's really strongly entwined into two. So yeah, you're technically getting two mini cases. How aren't you a thrill? Aren't you lucky? I'm covering the case of Jorge Ayala, but there wouldn't be a Jorge Ayala case to begin with if it wasn't for one woman, Griselda motherfucking Blanco, okay? We are going hitman in full strength, yeah? covering them all. She was the facilitator, you could say. She was the enforcer. She was the money maker that paid them all. But let's just have a Griselda Blanco corner to like allow you in and then uh, we can cover Jorge Ayala. So you kind of like picture everything and you understand it fully, all right? So set the scene in your head, okay? The way you set the scene of like how I'm presenting this case to you, yeah? Set the scene. It's 1970. We are in Miami Beach. It's hot, it's sunny, it's sweaty, but drug business is in its full spring yeah it's it's summer but the drug business is in its full spring this is 
the worst joke ever. And this drug business is run by over-controlling drug dealer who never stop at anything to get her money. She moved in there with her second husband, Alberto Bravo, and she's, just picture her, she's kind of like, first of all, Google Grisella Branco, like, right now, or check my Twitter page. Google her, just check her little face. I'm not shaming it here, okay? I have a really weird chin. And Griselda Blanco had like all these rules because she was kind of chubby by the end of her life. But like, she just had the weirdest chin. She had the, the most unfortunate chin, okay? You know the one that looks like balls on a guy? Yeah. Just look for her mug shots. It's like her prime time and then her mug shot and you're like, damn, prison and money and everything can really ruin people. Like, damn. I like, I really thought like she would look like those badass, you know, like Devil Wears Prada kind of bitches. No. Even within her life. That, that was her kind of like, what's it called? That's what works for her. Because she just looked like, what is happening in this quarantine thing? Why is everybody in the streets? <laughs> This is why, you see, recording from bed was so amazing. During her whole life, like, that's what she played that, like, looking like, a, you know, like an innocent little, you know, Cotillona, like, oh, she's that in CCTV grandma on the block, like, hi, everybody, and actually, she's, like, fucking dangerous as shit. She moved in to Miami. <laughs> she moved into Miami, like, as if Miami's a fucking house, with her second husband, and she's kind of, like, mm, scared, she's still, like, she, she moved there illegally, she's trying to find her feet, and just sort of a bit of a background she previously ran to escape the sexual assaults from her mother's boyfriend like so she ran away from home at the age of 16 and resorted to looting in Medellin until the age of 20 so she was kind of well prostituting herself in a way doing some sex work selling drugs you know doing like petty crimes as well trying to survive basically in Colombia so she immigrates to the US with her second husband Oh, what happened to her first husband? Well, it's kind of speculated that um, she hired somebody else to kill him as well. So her hitman work started, you know, in Colombia as well. But yeah, this guy doesn't isn't aware of that. Yep, it's all cool. It's all cool. So she immigrates to the US with fake passports. Again, very different times, okay? Very easy to just have a fake passport, just immigrate between one and another country. Like, yeah, you know, Trump wasn't the president. This was great. <laughs> different times, yeah. So she goes from Miami, she sets into New York, Griselda and Bravo establish a sizable cocaine business there. And now, like, her life is still unstable, right? So she was indicted on a federal drug conspiracy charges with other 30 of her subordinates. So she had a sizable business, you know, nice little startup of like 30 plus people. She flees to Colombia but before she could be arrested, but then she manages to somehow return to the United States again right? It's like, again, she gets another fake document, probably another, like, another, you know, different name, like, hey, it's me again, just a different face this time. And she settles to Miami in the 1970s. I put, it was different times when immigrants belonged wherever they wanted to make a name for themselves. So poetic. Just me and script writing. It's great. So her return to the US from Colombia kind of coincided with the beginning of public violent conflict that involved hundreds and hundreds of murders and killings yearly, which were associated with this high crime epidemic. So Miami was the center of crime. Coke, people being shot from the motorbikes, that was her modus operandi. To the point that law enforcement actually put a unit to end the influx of cocaine into Miami. It was called a Central Tactical Unit, please, please. So it was um, the Miami PD and the DEA anti-drug operation. So Griselda was involved in drug-related violence, known as the Miami Drug War or Cocaine Cowboy Wars. I like listened to some bits of that documentary, Cowboy, um, Cocaine Cowboys. I wasn't that impressed. I don't know. It might be because it was made like ages ago. I was just like, this is dry, I thought it was gonna be some dramatic shit, come on, it's Griselda motherfucking Blanco, okay? So this was the drug, um, the drug era that lasted in the 1970s and 1980s. <laughs> this was a time when cocaine was trafficked more than marijuana. Please give me the stats of what you mean. Oh, I love this part. <laughs> Sometimes I sound like I'm out for these criminals. I don't, but sometimes it's just immense shit and I'm like, this wouldn't have been a thing. Okay, it also led me onto a weird Google search. Okay, so she was actually personally involved in developing like creative methods to get coke into the US. So she set up a lingerie, lingerie, lingerie shop, right? That's how you pronounce it. In Colombia, in Colombia. That... <laughs> 
in Colombia that produced um, underwear for export with secret compartments. Of course, I Google this, okay? This is, again, the focus of all of this research that just goes into this, yeah? Suddenly, I'm like on page 10 on Google of nothing else but this part. So she had padded bras, right? So if you Google this... Okay, first of all, if you Google Grisada Blanco underwear, you're going to find... Go into images, because that's where you're gonna find this, because there is, like, this shop that named some underwear Grisada Blanco, and it just looks like a little pouch for your undies. This is not it, okay? <laughs> it's an images section. So she would, like, basically stick, like, little bags of coke onto the padded bras. It's, like, inside the padded bras, yeah. So because, obviously, even if somebody strips you... So you have to have, like, nice size boobs. You know, I would fail in that. She wouldn't need me. <laughs> little bags of coke. But then again, that's probably at least two free grams per boob. <laughs> So I don't know. I don't know. That's you know how many people do that need to to smuggle some substantial amounts of coke. Okay, I'm kind of now convinced that this is not the most genius plan ever. I'm so disappointed now. <laughs> I, just, I just really love this part, and now I'm like, but how? How was then coke more prevalent than marijuana? I'm not gonna Google this again. I swear to God, somebody let me know how many grams of coke can you transport in a bra, okay? I will not reveal your name, okay? Just let me know. <laughs> Another thing that took of some focus in this research, she was apparently supposed to be portrayed by Jennifer Lopez in a movie this year or something that was supposed to be shot, but now everything is postponed, but I just found that bizarre. And there's multiple articles announcing that. I just don't understand. There's just no, and not a single physical similarity. I mean, I understand they're both Latina, but like, no. <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense. Also, this is the kind of role that you give to somebody who is like, first of all, has a similar physical appearance, but someone like with street cred, maybe J-Lo in, you know, 90s. But like, not now. It just baffles me. Oh, what is going on on this street? Yeah, you know where I'm at, yeah, yeah. So she gets arrested by the DEA agents at her home and she's held without bail. So after her trial, she was literally only sentenced for like just a more over a decade, like 12, 13 years, if I remember right. Just nothing, nothing for somebody like who just murdered hundreds and hundreds of people. That's why it's smart, okay? If you hire hitmen and if they can't connect them to you, what can they charge you for? Drug trafficking. If she wasn't drug trafficking, fuck knows what this woman would have even been charged with. Don't put some blood on your hands and yeah, you, you're safe. Even for prison, of course, she continued to effectively run her coke business with the help of one of her sons. So, it will actually be the testimony of Jorge Ayala that gave the Miami State Attorney's Office sufficient evidence to indict her for three murders and we're gonna cover those murders in his case but yeah it's only those three murders and it's only because it's not like because one of them confessed but even this was really debatable and like <laughs> it was just like even this case sort of almost collapsed due to these technicalities relating to a telephone sex scandal between the star witness and female secretaries in district attorney's office it's just like everything is sort of going on technicalities you know it's like oh well yeah we are finally gonna nail her and it's like oh no actually uh your attorney's office is kind of dirty because there's these secretaries that kind of uh leaked some sex tapes and had uh, um, some phone sex with the main fucking suspect, okay? So how are we gonna do that? Because now your office looks kind of shady. <laughs> it's like the thing, if you're a police officer and you're like nailing the biggest criminal of that fucking decade, maybe go into your department and be like, are we clean? Are we going to this trial? Are we gonna look like fucking fools? So this whole thing, right? Of course, found a news article because again, what do we focus in this story? <laughs> if not on a fucking phone sex guy. As somebody who worked for call center for years, I understand how important this is for me to give some screen time, <laughs> some microphone time, okay, to the people doing the hard work in a call center, okay? So, the secretaries of uh, Miami State Attorney's Office have been suspended without pay over allegations that they had had phone sex with a confessed coke ring hitman and cashed money orders he sent them. <laughs> Beautiful, just beautiful. So, prosecutors feared that women's relationship with the prisoner Jorge Ayala could jeopardize. Oh God, sorry. 
could jeopardize the triple murder trial of Griselda, the godmother Planco. So Ayala is a witness in the case and the secretaries had access to the prosecutor's files. So it's like, oh, what do they know? Then like basically the defense might know as well as the prosecution you know it's kind of like case closed first of all you're shady but then somebody knows the information from the case as well because they were engaged in phone sex so the the real heroes in this in this story okay the two secretaries sherry rosbach and raquel navarro were suspended on friday <laughs> okay this is a news article from four, however ago okay <laughs> pending the outcome of the investigations. Both of them worked in major crimes division. Again, the units that these people worked for. It's not like, oh, a secretary at the entrance of the building. Nope. It's a major crimes division. This is genius, okay? So one of them worked directly for the assistant state attorney, the prosecutor in the Blanco case. Again, this guy could have known everything. Everything is compromised, you get me? So at least one of the phone conversations was taped. Obviously the secretaries didn't comment, but still, again, it's like just a compromised case. Like, how is this not even, you know, dismissed or like postponed to another jury chosen? Nope. So remember the part that she was there illegally in the first place, right? So she was in prison, but then released from it to be deported to Medellin, Colombia. And 2012, she dies because she has been shot twice, once in the head and once in the shoulder by this motorcyclist in Medellin, Colombia. Guess what? This was her modus operandi. This is how she used to get to people. Well, her hitman, right? It was all on motorcycles from the distance so that they can't be seen, you know, in high speed so that they can immediately skedaddle out of there. Right? The most important factor, yeah? Because karma is a bitch, okay? It goes around, comes around, full circle. This is it. How you kill people is how you're gonna die. This is why you don't commit crime, okay? <laughs> this is why you create a podcast and you don't commit your crime. <laughs> I, love, I love this detail. She was shot at Cardisa Butcher Shop, the corner 29th Street, as if anybody gives a fuck, after having bought $150 worth of meat. She was 69. Oh, sexual number. Nah. Oh, serious stuff. There's no doubt in my mind she killed and killed everybody because she was sexually assaulted, her mother didn't protect her, she felt like she was left alone in this world. Yeah, she had to fight for herself and act like a badass, act like she's tough, act like she doesn't have any scruples and any principles and she's just um, killing everybody in her way to get her to, to make a name for herself and to get herself to where she was. But... This is not a story about Griselda Blanco. It's a story about one of her cowboys, one of the men she used not to get her hands dirty. Jorge Ayala was convicted of killing three men, but is believed to have killed at least 12 for Griselda Blanco. We have our crime, we've got our killer. What was the motive? So the thing with Jorge Ayala was that he was not even arrested because of his hitman work. He was arrested to begin with because of, you know, his, his side jobs, yeah? <laughs> because, of course, somebody who has this as a main job has other shit as his side job that's uh, kind of shady. So he was involved in a Chicago bank robbery, and this was during the time when the authorities were on the high lookout, you could say, for everything, every crime-related things, because they thought it's uh, related to Griselda Blanco, and they were, in most cases, right. So they were searching for her hitman as well, because they knew that she wasn't the one who was getting the people killed, it was other people who were getting their hands dirty. After they captured him for this robbery, he starts talking really... Jorge or DV, um really love to talk, you know, it doesn't come as a surprise, does it? It's like usually people who are sort of serial killers just love, just love to like finally get the chance to tell everybody all the details, <laughs> which is why we have that sex case <laughs> scandal. So the police realizes that he is the assassin they have been looking for. They arrest him for a murder that he committed in 1982. Also, then there was this phone sex case where the secretaries exchanged, like, calls and pictures with Jorge and were paid up. Eventually, he gets convicted of only three murders that they managed to, well, get 
some evidence towards. And he was actually, for these three murders, he was actually sentenced to life in prison because, well, he was the one doing them. But I just find that so bizarre that Griselda got like 12 years. <laughs> this guy gets a life. And yeah, with the possibility of parole after 25 years. I find it bizarre because he actually testified against Griselda in order to avoid getting the death penalty. So it's like, hey, we take one thing off the table, but we still don't take the life sentence off. But she kind of, you know, gets crazy. Like she, she's the queen, real queen here. <laughs> it's like she's gonna get all the movies made about her as well. You are just a freaking cowboy. Just serve the purpose, Jorge. He's actually still in prison in the US, and if he was ever to be actually paroled, Old, he would also be deported to Colombia. You know, every time I think about deportation, I think about Orange is the New Black and how grim that actually is. It's not like, oh, hey, yeah, we're gonna deport you and then, like, you know, this other country is gonna welcome you, you know, with their arms open. No, they're going into the fucking unknown, okay? They're going to another prison. It's nothing as glamorous as it seems online, alright? This is why. Why should JLo portray Griselda fucking Blanco? What the actual fuck is happening in this neighborhood? It's giving you panic attacks now. <laughs> Swear to God, you know, I'm gonna make like actual recordings, yet yeah, of this nonsense, and then just use them throughout this fucking thing to give you like that unnerving feeling, yeah. And they can't sue me for copyright because it's actually recorded during this freaking recording for like three times. Dinero, dinero, se le busca de la calle. Yes, Pitbull. Who is this? Who is this, Pitbull? I'm Mr. Worldwide. Dinero, dinero, se le busca de la calle. I am quick mental in my head. Now that we know we are safe, he's still in prison. Also, um, just look up. <laughs> so just gonna go discuss his crimes and his background. But just look up how Jorge Ayala looked as a youngster and then how he looks in the jumpsuit. You know, in his trial and in prison. It's the scariest transformation. It's a lot scarier than Grisel does, okay? He has dead eyes. This guy just genuinely is like, yep, if you gave me a gun, like, he just looks like his face is telling, if you give him a gun again, he will shoot, he does not give a fuck. <laughs> don't release this guy, okay? <laughs> don't even deport him, don't release him, or whatever. Okay, let's discuss uh, his crimes. So Jorge was at best like a petty criminal before the Griselda time. And he wasn't the most of the lucky type of people that, that I would cover in this podcast. So. This guy, okay? So, let me just set the scene, right? He's in a club, and he in a club, he finds out there's going to be a shootout, right? So, we're in Miami, everybody's partying, everybody's on the highest, yeah, highest low. <laughs> he warns, like, his coke buddy in the toilet, and then that coke buddy goes into the club, like, goes back into the club, and tells the actual target. Basically, Jorge ruins this hit, and the hit was ordered by Griselda Blanco. Right, so she summons him after this evening, she's like, okay, come here, come into my premises, you fuck this up for me, okay? So, now, what you're gonna do is to save your life, this is how people get into crime, this is why you don't be a snitch, teach your kids not to be a snitch. She summons him, she's like, you're going to do this hit yourself, okay? Yep, you're a newbie, I don't give a fuck, okay? So you're going to kill two brothers, you're gonna get 50 grand per brother. He actually delivers one of them. By delivering, he doesn't kill him himself, he just brings him to Griselda and she kills him. This is a story, apparently she actually committed that murder. And not just that, but she actually, to show obviously this newbie not to mess with her, she chops this guy up and leaves him on the side of the road, just as a like message to everybody again not to mess with her. This is the part where I said she was ruthless as fuck. Another event now, uh, Griselda's son Osvaldo, which is the most telenovela name out there, I cannot deal with like, the way this woman named her sons, he got himself involved into some shit, so he just wanted to stay into his mate's house, and this mate was actually Griselda's former enforcer, again another hitman, Chucho, <laughs> so cute, so cute, you would never guess, you would think like he sends fucking churros, yeah? So, he wanted to stay at this guy's place overnight, right? And he pulled a mom card, yeah, it's like, mommy, I'm a mommy's boy, I have issues, yeah, let me stay, let me sleep here, or, you know, my mommy, my mom is powerful, yeah, mommy. So, this guy doesn't allow him to stay over, so Griselda sends Jorge to kill Chucho. What Jorge does, now Jorge is getting a bit cocky, right? He's like, no, let's go big gun style, yeah, big guns, yeah, we are pulling, like, crazy shit right now. So, he just does the drive-by, shoots the car, like, a hundred times, but this guy is not in the car, 
okay, again, he's luck and he's just dumbness, he's just beyond me at all times. But his two-year-old son was, so he killed his son, he killed Jujo's son. One crucial thing between Griselda and Jorge is that Jorge actually cared about other people not getting shot, which might actually be his downfall. Like, Griselda did not give a fuck if it was the son, if it was anybody, all the people had to go. If it was a hit and somebody's witnessing it, they can talk. Jorge wasn't like that. He actually was, like, really emotional and actually wanted to spare the kids as well. He actually wanted to report the death of a kid, but because he's a fugitive and involved into this nonsense, he takes the the body of Chusha's son and leaves him in front of a mosque and calls it in. So he was actually, he actually went back to Griselda and was, like, miserable. This kid died, but the guy didn't. But Griselda was happy. She was like, no, 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 in her logic, this is a son for a son. So she was actually even happier that this has happened. The logic in me, like, he didn't kill your son. He just didn't let him sleep over because he had mommy issues. I swear to God. So now he has proven himself enough, right? And he is her main boy. He gets a pay rise. He can't actually put the money in the bank, right? Because again, something you don't think about. The bank is just gonna look at you like, oh, so suddenly you have like a million bucks to put into your bank. How come? Like, the bank is gonna ask questions, so what he does is he keeps buying cars and getting girlfriends, because this is what you do if you're a motherfucking hitman in Miami in 1970s. Okay, so now we are in 1982. Remember that murder that he was actually convicted of? Because there were witnesses, right? He told police that Griselda ordered him to kill drug dealers Alfredo and Grisel Lorenzo. <laughs> <laughs> These names, uh, these fucking drug lord names, beautiful. So the Lorenzo brothers, yeah, they failed to pay for five kilos of coke. So they were shot by Ayala in their South Miami home as their three children watched television in another room. So of course Griselda was pissed because he left three other witnesses who had to find these parents then. But Jorge actually really didn't want to kill these kids again. Like, he had a boundary with children, so he didn't want no loved ones killed. He was like, no, this is what I have been paid for, this is my hit. Sort of, like, it's just, again, did the guy had morals, or was it just something that did his business as, you know, this is what I'm paid for? Gotta think, which one was it? Why Griselda was pissed? Again, because it was all about being ruthless and killing everybody in her way. And now everybody's gonna think like, hey, she's suddenly getting weak. Look at this. Like, she left like three people behind. How come? So it's all like, sort of like how this comes back to her rather than, hey, this guy actually did his job. And so just again to put things into perspective, Griselda would kill her hitman like a list with the names and prices next to them. So it's like, oh, you kill this person, this is what you're getting for them. So like, obviously, like they would hit the most price targets, right? So you kill them, you get the reward. And it was just everywhere. It was, as I mentioned, the modus operandi was usually, they would be on a motorcycle. So they would hit a target at church, funeral. She didn't care about clearing other people with the target as well. So at this time it was about, Miami had around 600 murders a year. They were most coke-related to the point that a van from Burger King was rented to freeze the dead bodies from the morgue because the morgue couldn't fit the amount of dead bodies that was in there. You know, just a fun fact to break this monotony of, of Jorge Ayala <laughs> rising to power. Just uh, think about a Burger King went for a second. I <laughs> put now this is when it goes Breaking Bad final seasons, guns blazing. Because there's this guy called Paco, yeah? Like, I don't know how there's nothing so cool and dramatic made about this. How is there Narcos? How is there so much on Escobar? And like, this is not as much on like fucking Griselda. So, Paco stole from Griselda, yeah? Jorge is obviously set out to, you know, like, you stole from, from my boss, gotta kill you. But he can't find him. But he kills 11 men on his crew. What he does is kind of smart, especially for Jorge, because we, we know this is not the brightest king in the book. He kills, yeah, 11 men on his crew. He left one person to spread the word, right? So it's like, yep, you, you tell everybody Griselda is on his tail, you're going, you are fucked. Look at this, it's ruthless, yeah? He also kills Paco's father like a few days afterwards. So he is just like, yep, I'm now, I'm ruthless. I'm killing everybody, but leaving somebody to just spread the word. He learns Paco has a new house and he blows it up. 
he just burns this house to the ground. But there's no sign of Paco. It's like, this is now becoming a history, Jorge, where you're killing, blowing shit up when the actual target is not in there. Okay, get, get a grip. Confirm they're there. Okay, but still, Griselda was happy because he finally proven that he, he got a point, right? He kills other people. You know, it to her it was like, cool, that was a message sent. When we track him down, we're gonna kill him. In between the crimes, Griselda and Jorge were doing coke and each other. Big sentence in the script. Life changing. <laughs> so she'd kill three other husbands and she cheated on all of them with Jorge. I put it was dumb because he was risking his life because she was killing everybody she slept with. Like, mate, get a grip, get other younger pussy, okay? This is not this type of podcast, okay? I don't give advice to criminals. <laughs> Definitely not. Jorge is now like, okay, I established a career for myself. I'm going to like get away from Griselda and this whole vibe. Yeah, I'm gonna be my own man. What he what he actually wanted is he just wanted to be a drug dealer. <laughs> He's just like my ambitions were limited, okay? Like I have went too far with this and I just want to be a drug dealer, Griselda. So he runs away with his girlfriend, and now she and her husband, another husband called Dario, split up. And both of them now actually ask Jorge to work for them. And Jorge somehow uses this to just get the fuck out and be like, yeah, but I'm not gonna work for any of them. It's cool. I know I'm good enough. I know it. I just wanna sell go, go, guy. Right? So he moves to Chicago. And one day, like years later, so he's just doing his drug dealer business in Chicago. Griselda calls him and he tells her he's out of the game. But she's like, I need you, you know, and she's like, somebody's threatening my family. So let me give you 50k for each man on the crew and 100k for the boss who is called Jaime Bravo. Jaime is the nephew of the Medellin bosses Alberto and Carlos Bravo. So basically they put the hit on Griselda's head and he's like, okay, what can I do? It's my boss, right? He runs back to Griselda. But he runs back to GB. <laughs> it's like, this is too long. GB, man. Great Britain, Griselda Blanco it can be anything. <laughs> he kills the man on the crew, right? But he still didn't kill Jaime. He runs into him in the mall accidentally. And now Jaime is surrounded by his bodyguards, by his men. Basically, Jorge tells him, Griselda wants you killed. But his approach was then... I don't know if this is smart or what, but this is the focus again where I read it in multiple articles. That he chats up the police and he like is asking them actually for directions, but it's making it look like he's pointing to Jaime's direction and somehow like Jaime just lets him leave and the man because he was technically trying to save his own ass, right? Because he realized he was outnumbered. So he's like, yeah, hey, yeah, let me just, <laughs> yeah, funny to see you here. Let me just go speak to the police. You know, after I just warned you that, like, you know, there's a target in your head. And then he just acts like he's asking for directions to the police, but he's actually pointing in the directions that they just leave him alone. If you thought that was cartoonish, though, how they actually, how the police and the DEA investigated this case, is that there was this informant who wore a wire, because they thought the result of was in the drug trade, right? This informant is like, yep, yeah, let me just pretend, you know, I'm a drug dealer. But obviously Griselda stepped up from that. So he meets up with her. <laughs> she tells him that she needs some guys taken care of. And this informant was just aiming to get a story about drugs. But like, she thought, you know, she needs these guys killed. So, they, like, Griselda sends the informant to freaking Jorge Ayala, yeah? Or he's just confused. He's like, um, this taken care of, what do you mean? You can just imagine it being like, um, you know, trying to speak in code, like, oh, you, you want somebody taken care of, uh-huh, where, um, on this uh, street, yeah, on this road, uh-huh, this time. And just uh, to clarify, by taken care of, you know, what do you mean? Oh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? I I mean what you mean and you're just like oh, what the fuck do I do <laughs> uh, this is already suspicious enough but yeah they don't suspect that this guy is an informant how fuck me so Jorge nearly avoids getting arrested here he just somehow played it dumb so this informant was working under a guy with the last name Palombo again how is I cannot deal with this how cartoonish this is you're just picturing it like a little cowboy cartoon thing but this is some serious thing that they're trying to nail a woman that for decades was ruling fucking Miami okay so this informant 
just manages to confuse this Jorge, right? And now Jorge nearly escapes, right? And this informant is then trying to connect to Griselda, but she isn't returning the calls because she's suddenly spooked. So Polombo is like, oh, this is collapsing, oh, fuck this investigation. Polombo's quote is, during this time, we had lost touch with her. She was... <laughs> She was giving me premature gray hair. Okay, Polomba, okay, it's like, my genetics is better than this, okay? And my wife was not very happy that I was spending all this time, long periods of time, in Southern California, when I had two young children. Polomba, you fucking chose to be a detective, you chose to work for the drugs department, okay? He's like, so one day, I just blurted out, if I ever catch her, I'm going to give her a kiss of death, because she's driving me crazy. Okay, okay, Palumbo, Dementors and Harry Potter have still not yet been published. A kiss of death, slightly, slightly romantic, yeah? <laughs> slightly poetic. <laughs> this kind of sounds like you might want something else with Griselda, she's driving you crazy, you want a kiss of death. Oh god, this whole thing is such a cartoon. I have brought you a cartoon in a freaking podcast version today, okay? This is it. Round of applause. Round of applause for Maya. Boom, 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 boom. Good. So, Palombo is like, fuck this shit. Let's call DEA. So, DEA is like, okay, we are literally out of, like, we have played all the angles. Let's go back to what we know her weaknesses, her sons. Why wasn't this the first point of call? You, you knew she had the children. Like, I don't understand this tactic. Like, what, exploit everything else and then go to the first thing you should have done? Okay, Osvaldo Blanco. Osvaldo rises again. <laughs> Osvaldo. Did everybody watch Cassandra? Like, with Osvaldo Rios. This is a big telenovela time. This is one of my first things that I watched in the 90s with my grandma. Literally, was three years old. Just learned how to read. It was like, yep, Spanish telenovelas have subtitles. Great. <laughs> this is my time to shine and practice reading. <laughs> Oh boy. Okay, Osvaldo. Mm. <laughs> the sentence is Osvaldo Blanco was a car nut. Who wrote this? Okay, if I was to refer to 20 somebody year old and say you're a car nut, w- would you say that's cool? Yeah, that's cool, Ingo Maya, yeah? So Palombo knew he visited this dealership often. So what they do is like, yeah, we, we ran out of things, so what we're doing, we're just like sitting in front of this dealership, you know, just hovering over it, just checking in, just watching, chilling eating stuff in the car. And when Osvaldo appears, Palombo nudges this informant. Probably the same, exact same informant, right? To accidentally bump into him. He says it worked like a charm, they partied all night long. It was actually because of her sons. <laughs> and because how they were just like, when I eve and partied with anybody that they got to hang of her actual drug trade. And then, well, once she was brought to court, Jorge spoke up, and then, then there was that <laughs> cool center hotline. This is why, if you are a criminal, you cannot have both. You cannot have a family life and a career, because, yeah, one or the other comes to bite you in the ass, doesn't it? Okay, uh, let's uh, now go and describe... Um, <laughs> describe... Describe Jorge's Medellin, Colombia background, and uh, see uh, why did he succumb to Griselda's power. <laughs> Okay, so Jorge was born in Colombia, brought to the US. He actually had like quite a stable childhood apparently from what the records say. He was always talkative and charismatic though, and he had that habit of bragging from his young childhood. It's like, you know, you just start chatting up with Jorge and he's like, yeah, I'm gonna tell you everything. You see, what I did yesterday was I got to a shop and I stole this uh, huge chunk of chocolate. <laughs> Oh god, and then uh, it escalated to like, yep, I did have sex with attorney secretary. <laughs> it's like, I did have phone sex with that attorney secretary. Yes, I confirmed that, your honor. <laughs> I am in such a weird mood, I'm actually losing my shit today. Okay. So in his like teenage years, he started as a mechanic in General Motors, you know? Not a bad company to start for even today, man. Go Jorge, go Jorge, you have a bright, a shining career, c- career in front of you, you know? You might end up on LinkedIn one day. Oh wait, you won't. So this is when he realizes, you see, this is what I'm saying. So at General Motors, he realizes he's great at breaking into cars. So what he does, he collects his mates who are car thieves, you know, genuinely, normally. Of course. And they pull this chop where they steal six cars at night. And then they sell them to a chop shop for like two to five hundred each. Which is good profit if you think about it. Yep. Still six cars. Yeah. Divided between each other. I mean, it's probably more than what you earn in a week as a mechanic at that time. 
he actually didn't need to steal. Like he was, he had stable upbringing. Yeah, he had a job. Like he would just cock a little shit. He was just like you know, little petty crimes that they won't escalate. It's okay, mom. Let's go. So he goes like, okay, cool. This job went well. So what he does is he steals a cartel member's car. Of course, just please. And now he tells this cartel member that if he wants to have his car back to cash out five hundred dollars for it, please know who you steal from, Jorge. Please. So cartel member is like, wow, oh, this guy has balls, and uh, he paid up. This is Jorge's account of, uh, of this story. Okay, they they might have beat him, beaten him up. Okay, we don't know this shit. But again, there's like immediately here so the the cartel member told him as boss he pays up but then he brings him to like the trunk of his car and showed him the uh, like some arms you know some weapons and he's like yep yeah, listen i give you 5k to take these to miami this is how Jorge started exploring Miami in that totally non-touristic kind of way. So once he's in Miami, he's doing like odd jobs. So he's basically either like a debt collector for a, another cartel man, or he's a drug delivery guy. Like jobs that nobody wanted, but it was Medellin cartel. So they paid up nicely, like 1k a day, which today would be about 3,000. Like, not bad, man, even for today's thing. Like, this guy was doing okay for himself. And this is when he gets the taste of what he can do and how he can stand up for himself. And he finally like exploited all of his talents. And he was like, yes, this is it. And then that weird club thing happens where he snitches and uh, he gets stitches, guys. Snitches get the motherfucking stitches, okay? So this is the case of Jorge Ayala. And now let's discuss the motives behind his crimes. As a primary motive here, I put greed not so much for money but for fame okay this is that thing where it's like no i need to stand out from my past you know i need to focus on the future i'm standing out from the pool of hitmen as well and i need to prove myself to griselda so so that i can support myself but it was more than support like because again as i said he had the job to begin with he didn't need all of this, he was just cocky little shit that needed fame, that wanted to become famous. But what he never understood, and I don't think Jorge was particularly smart of a man, is that unless you are the major mob boss, or you are the person ordering these kids, you are nobody, you are being used as a tool. You are the enforcer, okay? Somebody else is giving you the orders and paying you the money. Technically like a fucking delivery guy. <laughs> You just deliver bullets, okay? So it's his love for fame. Um, I think some of you might say that it was fear for his life because he knew how other men in Griselda's life ended up. I don't think that was that much of a case. I just think he knew where he could get the fame, he, where he could get the most money, and that's why he returned to Griselda to begin with as well. I think it was a lot less about fear for his life because he knew like he lived without her, selling drugs for quite some time, so he knew that yeah, she wasn't going to come like after him in that way because she needed him as a hitman. So I don't think it was that. No, I have one rapid fire fact here. Because when I heard that one of Griselda's sons, when his name was Waldo, I had to look up the other names and they, trust me, I do not understand. But okay, Griselda's sons. Bear in mind, this is 1970s. Dixon, Uber. <laughs> Well, you know, Uber, I don't know how she was, she pronounced it the Spanish way. Whichever way was Uber named after Uber Blanco. <laughs> and Osvaldo. Then she had fourth son, the one that was helping her run the drug business when she was in prison. She named this guy after the Godfather movie. She named him Michael Corleone. Nothing makes sense in this story. This is a cartoon. <laughs> I have just told you a cartoon, okay? I just, yeah, let's just have like, you know... <laughs> The Looney Tunes intro and outro to this. <laughs> the sources for this podcast have been Murder Dictionary Podcast, Guardian, Miami Herald, the article in Maxim Searching for the Godmother of Crime, gpnews.com, and the beautiful... This, okay, I'm going to publish this article on Vice. It's in Spanish, but it is just the golden... It's just gold. Just because of the images. It's not even the text. Although, yeah, you should check out the text as well. But it's just, it's called Griselda Blanco, Hasta Nunca y Gracias por la Coca. It is just the highlight of my life. It's just pictures of her, pictures of like news articles from the time, pictures of like pages of covers, their uh, mugshots, everything. It's just beautiful. 
beautiful guys i have never read a more beautiful article i am definitely losing it over this case but yeah i hope uh, you enjoy that <laughs> you know and um yeah i'm covering other hitmen this month so uh let's keep that coming i, I don't think anything would match the love i have for Griselda blanco the very very unhealthy love but um yeah let's see how that goes <laughs> Well, I sure as hell hope you enjoy that story as much as I enjoyed researching it and then telling it. You can see I was losing it a bit, you could tell. Basically, this whole month, I am just in some nonsensical, like, I'm in some crazy limbo when I'm researching this hitman. Because it's just stuff that I've never researched before, never encountered before, so I don't fully, like, understand it. And then I make it into, like, a very simplified cartoonish way. Next week, I'm covering Benjamin Siegel. That's sort of like, you can picture it as a black and white movie. Wait, that's how I'm gonna portray it. Even though it's still a freaking cartoon. <laughs> So I sure as hell hope you are as excited after you hear this story as excited as it seemed and was losing it while covering it. Well, you can always let me know what you think, you know? There's Patreon where you can join the community and listen to other stuff. So the April episode is already out that we'll be covering. Glamour Girl Slayer. It's fascinating. Anyways, not even gonna spoil it. Yeah, you can always let me know what you thought about this episode by tweeting to me at thatbampod or emailing podbam at gmail.com. Now, because we're all stuck in the houses, I have three whole recommendations for you, yeah? Holy, like holy milk. Of course, I never edited that out. So for all of you that know me and follow me on my personal socials, you know how much I am obsessed with La Casa de Papel. Like, I lived every single of those seasons like it was my own skin. Like, it was me right there because, probably because of the binging effects, yeah, it's an actual thing. So after you binge for about nine hours for the whole season, and then you get out of your room, you're like, damn, yep, the effects are still there. Life is a lot more intense. So yes, I am still having like PTSD today. I'm still pretty much uh, having meltdowns like on the street and everywhere. This show definitely tops my list of a number of shows that I've seen. Just because Americans can't do it as Europeans, okay? Just because there's never that like raw emotional feels around gay people, around transgenders. It's always like the Americans always just focus, you know, too much on the action, and it's kind of like everything else is sort of considered in that bullish way. There is here it's like people are the center of the story and the producers know that it's them who people are going to relate to so they need to focus like on their lives and make it raw and very emotional it just has some of the most important messages towards the police towards the authority it's all about the resistance and like how criminals can actually work to use media and to use the public to transform the image of themselves i mean we've seen it from the people i cover in the show and from others that interest in the true crime how many people are just charismatic enough to sort of like turn the whole of the public onto their side? How many people we still have that fetishize all these like serial killers and that still have crushes over them even though they have killed brutally so many people? So this is sort of like that on a group level. And I mean, it's just, you know, they're just robbers, okay? Come on, don't don't put them there on the same level. Like, hey, Maya fetishizes crimes and criminals, okay? Don't put it out there, like... So this whole week for me has been just really about vulnerability and about just getting through and getting the right emotions out. And then, like, Asa de Papel was just, like, you know, the cherry on top of a cake. So in that light, I've been sort of binge listening to the podcast by Brene Brown, which is Unlocking Us. You might know Brene Brown from either her really famous TED talk or if you've read any of her, like Daring Greatly, Dare to Lead. She researches on vulnerability and it is sort of in a self-help kind of way, but like really approachable and with like real life analogies towards, you know, people's situations and giving like actual examples that people can relate, which many researchers can't just do. They just see data and they just see samples and they can't actually reiterate this to people. So I like listened to a lot of her things and read a lot of her books last year. And that's kind of how the podcast came about actually, because she preaches about without vulnerability, there's no creativity. It's people that actually take the step forward and take the stage and actually do something that they want to do that are brave rather than the critics. 
and well, I wanted to do podcast for the longest time, but was always like, oh, who's going to listen to this? You know, who's going to listen to this accent, this voice, this weird sense of humor, and me laughing into my microphone during recording? It's like, I can't deal with the backlash. I'm like, I'm going to have like people hating on it and stuff. And then I was like, you know what? Like, why wouldn't I do it? I'm doing this for myself. People will hate on my accent and this voice and uh, the version of the stories I'm telling you, even if I'm hidden in a freaking mouse hole and just not expressing anything. They'll be like, oh, remember Maya? That girl was weird, wasn't she? Let's hate on her. So Brene had this guest, which I had no clue, never heard of this woman, and now, well, I'm listening to, like, her audiobook. I'm halfway in, and I love it. She's called Glennon Doyle, and her book is called Untamed. It's, again, uh, very similar to, like, well, self-helpish kind of area, or like personal development, whichever you want to call it. But it's just great in a sense of like positive influence towards women and on identifying like the patterns where she as a mother was differentiating between her son and her daughter based on how society told them to bring them up. What is going on in this neighborhood? <laughs> But yeah, the book is about her actually coming out after years and years of marriage, having had two kids, and then just, yeah, that stigma around her just finally being untamed and finally feeling free, stepping up and doing shit for herself. Those are my three recommendations. So to draw crime-ish, a lot of it not. And on that note, after binging on La Casa yesterday, I basically had this, you know, uh, (laughs) post-meltdown run, which was totally not the most intense run ever. And during it, I was thinking about how to conclude this episode ba- and sort of how to align it to what I said in the last one, which was about me being comfortable during this time and being completely okay with social distancing, you know, like, hey, I've been prepping my whole life for this shit and I don't understand how people get bored. And yesterday, just as I was finishing the run, I just, like, had this sort of moment where I realized that this is all because I finally feel, like, fully in control of this situation and that's why I'm fearing like what it will be like once we are out of it like a true control freak I can actually control every single aspect of my life now every single minute what I'm doing and when and you know what content I'm consuming and it feels good and that's why it feels good so for everybody out there still struggling to figure it out find little things you can control the way I said it I think two episodes ago sort of like either setting up a routine or setting up exact time because you're doing things and just go for it and then you might be as comfortable during those times of the day and then it makes the rest of it easier and guess what once all of this is done and people listen to these episodes they're gonna be like Ugh, just edit this shit out like it doesn't count it's it's actually really like it's funny like why are we giving people advice why is everybody addressing it because it's a current situation and this is a podcast that comes in a current time okay i didn't record motherfucking jorge ayala episode like 20 years ago fuck's sake if podcasts were a thing during spanish flu yeah they would have been talking about spanish flu you little shit how many podcasts are there just about coronavirus yeah you don't don't listen to them (laughs) or at least please for god's sake limit yourself to listening and getting the news okay don't be like fully me sometimes fully in denial towards things and just waking up like oh this is a normal day and then having like the reality crush into your face like an hour from waking up or you know nine hours after you binge on a series But also don't go to the other extreme where you only listen to coronavirus and how many people are dead in the world right now because of it for the whole day. Because what the fuck are you doing with your life? Balance. Balance. God, this is the longest outro of the century. What did I even say in it? So I'm gonna leave you right now, yeah? Yeah? Are you gonna are you gonna handle it? Yeah? I'm gonna leave you with the thoughts of Griselda motherfucking Blanco and uh, her little puppet Jorge Ayala. Sorry for the people out there who thought Jorge Ayala was the shit. I debunked some myths during this podcast. And off you go on to your next victory, yeah? This is how you go into your next Zoom call. Yeah? You just tell them all, Maya again, yet again, yet another Monday. Maya gave us advice to survive. <laughs> Oh boy. It's all jokes until one day I release a self-help book, okay? It's all jokes until then. (laughs) In the words of a famous philosopher, don't you ever feel like a plastic bag. Keep making the world a better place, one mode at a time. Bye, fuckers.